first rookie mistake still muted. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Biva webinar. Uh, this evening, it's a beginner's Q&A session. Uh, we've got uh, a plethora of uh, beekeeping experience before us. Uh, Jane Medwell uh, is a, a master beekeeper uh, from Warwickshire. Uh, uh, Roger Patterson, who has uh, many years of, uh, of life experience in beekeeping. And Stephen Barnes, who some of you will know, uh, not only is a Biba trustee, but uh, is also uh, uh, part of uh, the BBKA as well. Uh, so some uh, well-known faces out there, uh, but uh, very widely spaced apart. So uh, we've got Jane on there from, from Warwickshire. We've got Roger down in East Sussex and we've got uh, Stephen uh, West Sussex. Sorry, not East Sussex. Sussex. Sorry, in the West, not the East. Uh, and we've got Stephen from Cumbria, uh, just 20 miles uh, from the Scottish border. So tonight's answers are uh, going to be based on uh, each person's experience of their locality, which is, is quite useful, really. So where uh, questioners have submitted their question and, and told us where the, uh, they are uh, they're located, uh, I'll try and throw that in so it gives a bit of context to uh, the question. Good evening, panel. And, uh, and welcome. Thank you for giving up your time this evening. Uh, so uh, we've been inundated with quite a few questions. Um, and uh, don't forget those that are joining us by Zoom. Um, you can use the chat function. And uh, if we've got time at the end of the, uh, the questions to ask any supplementary questions, then, uh, then I'll take those from there as well. Uh, but we're also joined uh, on YouTube by another 76 uh, people watching live uh, on YouTube. Uh, great welcome to you as well. Uh, so we'll get straight to it then uh, with only an hour to answer all these questions. I'm sure our panel could speak uh, for a lot longer than an hour so uh, we'll start straight away. So the first question then for the panel is um, what's the best way with minimum disturbance to check uh, food supplies uh, and the bees at the moment? So this questioner uh, has got uh, British National Standard Hives uh, with the Queen Excluder off um, and uh, the supers were very heavy in the autumn, and he thinks that they should uh, see the bees through until February. But he wants to know how is the best way to check to make sure that the bees have sufficient stores in order to get them through uh, through the winter. Uh, Jane, would you like to start us off? Right. Well, you need about 20 kilos of stores to get through the winter. And in a British national, that will mean they're either crammed or they're crammed and there's a, a super above or below. Now, I'd heft, so I put my hand under the bottom of the hive, lift it a little bit and see how heavy it feels, and I will know if it feels heavy enough to be safe. But it takes a few years of doing that. You can use either an electronic luggage scale or a spring balance and hook it on to first one side, then the other side of the hive and work out how much it weighs. But remember, you have to include the weight of the hive. I would recommend that everybody learns to heft to get the feel of how heavy is heavy enough. I wouldn't recommend uh, you know, breaking the hive open. I feel slightly concerned by the word supers on a national over the winter because that's quite a lot of space to heat and the bees, of course, will be generating that heat uh, based on the, their consumption of carbohydrate. So I would probably recommend letting them take down as much as they want and reducing it to one super, but it's too late to do that this year. So hefting would be my recommendation. And if you can get an experienced bee beekeeper to come and heft with you, you can sort of calibrate yourself so that you know how heavy is heavy enough. And honestly, that knowledge stays with you. What do you think, Roger? Um, well, you mentioned the weight, which quite frankly, um, I dislike because um, it makes quite a difference what sort of bees you've got. If you've got um, bees with a prolific queen, you can easily go through two or three times the amount of, uh, of stores than if you've got um, uh, a, a non-prolific queen. And... Um, if you look through the uh, literature, you'll find these figures are all over the place. And I've seen them recently, even up to 90 pounds, which is, 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 is huge. Um, so um, I'd rather people got to know their bees and how much they, uh, they consume. 
Personally, if it's a really cold day, you get a cold snap, I wouldn't have, the to- uh, have a problem just whipping the crown board off. If you can just gently whip the crown board off, have a look, and if you can see six or eight seams of sealed food looking at you, uh, and you can't see the bees because they're right down in the, um, uh, in the area where they're clustering, I would say they were, uh, they were okay. And I, and I really don't think that's, um, uh, that's affecting them uh, at all. Uh, Ten seconds, that's all you need. Stephen, do you uh, heft your hives? He's fallen asleep. Absolutely, I yeah. Uh, I also use a, a luggage scale. No, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, yeah, just a slight delay on, uh, on, on your feet. So, yeah, fire away. I'm wide awake. Couldn't miss a word that Roger says. Um, yes, I heft my hives, but I also use a mechanical luggage scale. Uh, and what I'm looking for there is, is the rate in which the weight is decreasing. Um, if you use the scale, you get an idea of how much is uh, being lost each week. And if it feels like, then I, I'll stick a slab of fondant on it. Yeah, Some no. of our members have actually got these lovely sensor kits that have a scale beneath the hive, and you can actually see them consuming about a pound, sorry, new money, 500 grams of uh, carbohydrate a week. But then, you know, it's really interesting because a few weeks ago we got a, a sudden increase of a kilo on one. Somebody had stuck a brick on the roof. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, can, can I go back just a little bit? Because I, I also do hefting as well. Now, it's okay these days because for the modern hives, they're all more or less the same uh, weight. Uh, but some of my hives are 60, 70 years old. And um, in those days, um, they were, well, certainly going into the 40s, late 40s and 50s, they were made out of any wood that was available because of, you know, the Western Red Cedar just wasn't, um, wasn't available. And some of my... Um, uh, brew chambers weigh three times what others do, uh, but that's that's sort of older beekeepers. I know we're talking about uh, beginners now, but if you if you buy some old equipment, um, the weight of uh, bo- weight of boxes can vary quite a bit. Yeah, always oh, good to have a baseline assessment before the the winter and, and know how the how much the actual hive weighs. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so the next question then. Um, What's the best approach to take if during my first spring inspection, I realise that uh, my overwinter colonies have become, uh, work, uh, well, this says worker layers. Uh, I'm wondering if they mean a drone laying colony. Um, it, 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 this one's coming from Hertfordshire. So you open up the, the, the colony in spring and uh, you can see that the queen has been laying, but it's, it looks like it's drone brood that's being laid. What's the best way to, uh, to remedy that one? Uh, Stephen, do you want to start that one? Um, yeah, I would panic, I think, to start with. Um, it depends whether I've got any other colonies uh, available to help them out. Um, if it's if I've just got the one colony, then um, you're in difficulties because you won't be able to find a queen if it's early in the season, uh, and also they're they're running out of uh, bees that have overwintered. So I think it would depend on whether you've got a, a an extra colony to help them out. In which case, I would be entering uh, frames of seal brood to keep them going. Uh, Jane? Um, Now, I wasn't quite sure whether this was a drone layer or laying workers. I suspect drone layer. We've all had that disappointing experience in the spring where the Queen's not mated terribly well the previous year and, you know, has run out or and is laying drones. And, you know, I can only agree with Stephen. I would wait until it was warm enough perhaps for a unite, probably take out and uh, squish the queen and unite the remains with another colony, having checked, of course, that they're both healthy. Um, Because realistically, I'm not going to be able to do a lot with that queen. And of course, if there is drone brood in that comb, it will have spoiled that comb as well. So 
there's not a lot to save there. The prognosis is even worse for laying workers, but I think it's unlikely to be laying workers so early in the spring. Excellent. Roger, anything to add? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Um, a week ago, we had exactly the same um, a question and answer, but for the uh, experienced beekeepers. And I think the answer would be different um, because a beginner, I think, would probably um, want to try and save a colony. A more experienced beekeeper would think that that lot isn't worth saving and, uh, 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 and wouldn't bother. So I think it's a, 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 a different situation. But I, uh, for beginners, I wouldn't, um, wouldn't go any further than... Um, uh, Stephen and uh, Jane are gone. Yeah, I, and, and I, I don't know what the panel, but I think I know what Roger would say, but I don't know about the other two, about if you're starting with bees, always better perhaps to have two colonies rather than one, because you can always get yourself out of a sticky situation if you've got that, uh, that spare colony uh, mm -hmm. in the apiary as well. Yeah, yes, I, I would say absolutely that you need more than one colony. Uh, I was only ever going to keep two, I've now got 40, so <laughs> I don't know what went wrong. That's, I uh, don't know how that happens, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's um, called Bree Fever. <laughs> uh, so the next question is about Bailey comb change. Uh, so uh, kind of uh, starting to get from, from a beginner to, to moving into advance, I suppose, or, uh, with a Bailey comb change, because you've... You, you're having to think about what you're doing. So the, the question is, can you explain more about a Bailey comb change? Uh, first year to, uh, into beekeeping, and it was mentioned that it would be good to change out the frames uh, early next year, and perhaps a Bailey comb change would be best. Can you explain the when, how, and the do's and don'ts, please? Who wants to take that one? Join. <laughs> Well, actually, I, actually, I've never done it for those purposes, but um, so um, I'm not really the person to answer it. I can chip in with what the others say. But. Well, I'm definitely a supporter of Roger's approach. I, I, I do think that changing comb is a good thing to do. And like Roger, I do quite a number of short swarms these days. But the Bailey comb chain was originally invented by Bill, well, Leslie Bailey, um, to treat Nassima. And it's a more gentle way of changing all the comb at once over three weeks. <laughs> and basically, uh, there are two different ways of doing it. One, what we call for a small colony, would be as a decima treatment. And it focuses on getting rid of the pathogen and slimming down the colony and uh, having a small amount of foundation to change to start with. Most usual, though, is a Bailey frame change for a largish colony. So there's a clue. I would certainly wait until the weather had warmed up because what you want them to do is to pull out new comb. So I'd do a Bailey frame change when they're going to pull out wax. Now, in the books, they always have a couple of supers on top so you don't need to feed. Yeah. But in fact you can do it and feed a nice heavy syrup in a contact feeder and they will pull out wax beautifully as they do in a shook swarm and go like a train afterwards. Um, so basically a Bailey frame change means uh, putting another box. I like to use foundation because I don't like to um, fumigate drawn comb particularly. So I like to use foundation let them start to draw that. After about a week, I put in a queen excluder between the old box and the new box. And I have a special eek with an entrance, which I align with the original entrance and block up the original entrance. Mm. So they then start using the top box. I've got my contact feeder on, they're drawing out the wax. After three weeks, all the bottom brood is hatched out I can take away and render that comb and effectively I've got new comb with very little trauma. Now, it's not as quick as um, a shook swarm and for a, a really healthy colony, I, I do like a shook swarm, but it's an ideal manipulation to do when you go on holiday. Because they're not going to swarm while they're pulling out all that wax. Obviously, uh, it's 
the queen in the top box is important. I was just going to say, sorry to interrupt there, Jen. I was just going to say, you've already answered a question that come, that we've got coming up later then about, <laughs> uh, for oh, somebody, which is no, oh, not at all. Uh, no, no, you're fantastic at this. It's a good uh, a good segue into that question later on. Um, anything that um, anybody else would add to, uh, to, to Jane's description? Uh, I don't want to uh, contradict Jane, but I, I was going to say that don't, uh, assume that they won't swarm in that situation because I've had them swarm. Right. You see, bees don't read the bees. book. Yeah. No, I, I mean, in theory, they shouldn't, but I had one colony. It was, it was obviously a bit late to do it and it got swarming in their minds and they carried on with it. There's a, there's a book just come out called Challenge What You're Told. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Who's the author of that? I, 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 I can't. I, I can't remember. <laughs> There's one sold already. <laughs> uh, I, I will actually mention uh, the BBKA do have some ex excellent. Uh, oh, it's green, so it's showing through. But have some really good laminated, laminated uh, cards uh, yeah. for both the uh, the week and the. Uh, uh, and the usual Bailey comb change method, if uh, and they're quite useful to have in the apiary if you if you're doing it for a first time or um, if you. If, the thing is, if you're only a beginner or an inexperienced beekeeper, throughout the year you might only be doing this once a year, or you might be might not even be yearly. So by the time you come to doing it again in a couple of years' time, you forget all these things. So it is useful. Sorry, Stephen. Go ahead. No, so I was just going to plug the, the, the good thing with those laminated ones, even if you're intermediate uh, standard beekeeper, they're useful aid memoirs when you're out at the hive. You just pull it out and look at it. And because it's laminated, wipe it clean when you finish. Mm. But the other thing I'd like to say is that I agree with Jane about shook swarms. There's nothing like a good shook swarm. They really do take off. Mm. And al although you are um, worried about losing all the brood that's in the original colony, they more than make up for it. Um, yeah, can I mention something that, um, or say something about what Jane mentioned? People don't seem to realise that bees will not draw out um, comb unless they've got some sort of income, mm -hmm. and they just seem to put supers or brood chambers on top uh, of the boxes, and then wonder why the bees don't, um, in, in poor weather, then wonder why the bees don't draw them out. Mm. So you know, as, as, as we're in a beginner's group, they really need to know that. Yes. And you can always guarantee that you, you, you put the box on a, a foundation and the next five days are solid rain, yes. um, yeah. even if it hasn't, uh, hasn't forecasted it. Uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, You've so lived in Cumbria as well, Richard. <laughs> it gets like that up here, down here in Yorkshire as well. Uh, next question then. Uh, should I use thymol in my syrup? Should I use thymol in my syrup? Uh, Stephen, do you use I, I don't. Um, and that's mainly because I use uh, inverted sugar, uh, the ambrosius type of sugar, uh, and you shouldn't put thymol in that. I understand that it's beneficial in that it stops the uh, granulated sugar going off. If you're feeding them sugar syrup, it stops it going off. Uh, but apart from that, I've got no experience of it, so... Yeah, I've, I've actually got quite a lot with it. I've used it probably the last 15 years or so, uh, and I wish I'd used it, it, it earlier. Uh, thymol is a very powerful uh, disinfectant. In fact, I've written quite a lot, uh, quite, a, quite a large page on Cushman's website about this, or rather expanded what Dave, uh, Dave wrote. Uh, if you read online, there's actually quite some erroneous information uh, 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 about it. Um, but let's not worry too much about that. Um, there's three things it really does one is it stops the black sludge because it's um a sort of disinfectant anti uh, bacterial antifungal all sorts of things like that it stops the black sludge that you get in uh feeders and um, containers uh so that, that that's one good thing uh it stops fermentation which is um the the reason that it was originally um used and in fact it goes right back to the early 1930s the earliest I could find any records of it was um, an article in Beecraft in about 1931 or 32 um, by a man called Dr. Killick. Um, and um, although we're not allowed to use 
uh, any unregistered uh, product for um, uh, for treating disease. Um, there are two useful papers. One, I think, is Pakistan, and the other one's Australian. Um, that um, uh, where the research shows that it it, um, it deals with nosema. So I would I would carry on um, using it because you can have uh, syrup in a container from one year to another, and it doesn't ferment. So I uh, I, I would recommend it. Also, of course, it uh, it doesn't ferment in the hive. So it, the, the the bees don't end up getting dysentery. Jane, do you use thymol? Well, I'm very lucky in my branch. We have a cooperative, and so we can we purchase invert syrup at less than we can get sugar for anywhere. So I switched to invert syrup a few years ago, which doesn't need thymol and doesn't um, ferment or um, get the black mold in it. So I haven't, you know, needed it in recent years. Even sorry, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I was just just going to say, um, with the invert sugar, you probably shouldn't add thymol to that, or at least I've been told not to add thymol to that, and you don't need it. Yeah, Stephen, how do you make up the the thymol to add into the uh, the sugar syrup? You need to add. Ask Roger that question. Ah, sorry, Roger. How do you make up the thymol to? Yeah, add to it's it's all on uh, uh, Cushman's website. If you uh, if you can get that up, um, basically uh, the thymol won't dissolve in in water, so you've got to dissolve it in alcohol first, an only small amount. Um, and uh, I, I better not give you the the, the quantities in, in in case you get it wrong. There, you you've got it. Yeah, if you go down to the bottom. Um, yeah, here we are. I'll put three heaps of tea. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that one. Yeah, yeah, that 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 one there. Um, that um, the that 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 works well, and it's basically a, a sort of uh, um, modern version of the uh, volumes and the weights that um, Manly used. Of course, Manly's given the credit for. Um, uh, uh, for coming out with the idea in the first place, but in fact, all he did was popularise it. It was this Dr. Killick that um, um, that, uh, that came up with the idea. Excellent. And just uh, quickly for anybody who wanted the, somebody's asked about the laminated sheets, they're on the uh, BBKA website in the shop. If you, if you Google BBKA and uh, Bailey Comb Change, you'll find the, uh, the, the uh, page for those. Uh, so next question. Thank you for that. Uh, Next question is about Varroa treatments. So um, do, do the panel treat for Varroa? And uh, if you do, could you outline your system? If you don't, can you explain what you do um, if, if you don't? Um, Stephen, uh, shall we start with you? Yeah, you can start with me. I, I monitor Varroa levels on my colonies um, and uh, I sort of set one apiary aside to see if we can get resistance developing. <laughs> the other ones uh, are monitoring if they need treating, I'll treat the whole apiary, not just the hive that's got the high mite drop. In, I use um, oxalic acid vaporizer for winter treatment uh, and uh, a variety of choices during the summer, depending on whether I've got honey on or not. Uh, and I've used uh, the formic acid treatment, um, and uh, I've used some of the other, Apigard, isn't it, in the autumn. But it, it, I monitor first to see whether they need treatment. Jane, should, should people just treat regardless? Absolutely not. I do treat, and um, I recent, uh, recently watched um, a webinar by David Evans, who used to be a member of my branch. I think, actually, it might have been a webinar Roger arranged um, uh, about rational varroa treatment. And he talked about the need to preserve our winter bees as long as possible and talked about uh, making sure your treatments hit the point where the winter bees are starting to be produced and then knock off the phoretic or parasitic mites in the winter. So that's what I've been doing. So I treated, for instance, this year, 
be, uh, I alternate treat, um, the strong treatments. I used Max because I still had supers on uh, towards the end of August and the Max deal with Varroa in the cells as well as on the mites and really brought the mite population down. And I, in that way, made sure that the bees being produced to last over the winter, the winter bees, which really do need to last a long time, are as least bothered as possible. And I've also, just this last week, I don't have a, a vaporizer, so I trickled oxalic acid to remove the last of the um, mites riding on the bees, again, to give those winter bees the best chance of getting through, because we know those mites are actually feeding on those winter bees. And in that way, I hope that I shall not need to, fit, to treat in the spring. Uh, if I do the same regime, because I will only treat where I see a drop, and I, I do the old putting a board in for seven days. If I uh, do it next year, I will use a different summer treatment. I don't use the same thing each year, probably Apivar, which is a kind of nuclear option. It's a sort of nerve agent. Um, so I realize that, you know, that I'm a, a sort of um, very orthodox treater in that way. Excellent, thank you. Roger, how, what's your approach to Varroa? Uh, well, how, how long have you got? Because um, don't forget, I'm involved with, I'm the apiary manager of the Whisper Green um, Association apiary, which we've got two, uh, two apiaries. So I treat them, those two uh, differently. Um, one for the last three years, I uh, haven't treated, sorry, four years, haven't treated at all. And um, losses have been fairly minimal. But a mile away, um, uh, as the crow flies, um, we had heavy losses last year by just um, not treating for just one year. Um, so um, it's it is very hit and miss. As far as my own bees are concerned, last year I didn't treat at all, but up until then, uh, Apigard and oxalic oxalic acid. Uh, sorry, yeah, ox oxalic acid trickle during the um, during the winter. Now, I'm afraid um, what the three of us are saying really probably isn't actually helping the beginners who 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 really want to know. Um, uh, and that, I think, is one, well, one of the issues with the, with the sort of question uh, lot is because what suits one may not suit another. Um, Jane mentioned Max. Well, as you know, I use castellated faces in the brood chambers. Well, Max just rips the plating off the um, the galvanising off the um, uh, off the. Um, it's folic acid, that one. Sorry, yeah, formic acid. acid. Yes. Sorry, yeah. Roger. Ma form. Yeah, Ma Ma Max is formic acid. Uh, sorry, but it's the only one I think that treats the uh, mites in the cells. Yeah. Mm. So it's it's it, it, it is difficult, but what we did as a um, uh, as a, um, uh, a sort of teaching uh, session was that we used everything that was uh, registered um, on a, about 30 colonies. We split them up into equal, equal numbers of four. And what we found was um, the mite drop in the spring was about the same and the winter losses were about the same. So I don't really think it makes too much difference what you use. Uh, Stephen, I'm uh, just, just going to say what, one of the uh, problems is if you can treat, um, you need to make sure that the beekeepers around you are also treating because you can get a treatment that's successful and then you get a, a mite bomb coming to your hive with failing colonies from elsewhere. So I think you need to work together as an association to ensure that the treatment is uniform. Well, then if we don't treat, how will the other bees going to build up resistance? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a very easy one to, um, to decide what to do. Well, I think, I think with the, the not treat program, you have to be ruthless and colonies which are suffering high mite levels, you need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, using whatever treatment you choose to use, 
uh, what, is there any tips or, or key messages that you would give to beekeepers in terms of using a particular treatment? Uh, I'm thinking about the labels, etc. Jane? Yes. Um, you're required to fill in a veterinary medicines register and the bee inspector will want to see that if they come to see you. Uh, you can get various templates. There's one on the BBK website, for instance. Personally, the first thing I do is photograph the um, receipt that I, for the place I bought it from and the labels. And therefore, I've got the dates and the serial numbers in case anybody asks for them. Um, and follow the instructions. I know it sounds ridiculous, but Macs are seriously nasty stuff when you first put them on. Formic acid may be natural, but that doesn't mean it's nice. Yeah. And so treat it with extreme caution, very thick gloves and breathing apparatus. Likewise, oxalic acid, just because it's in rhubarb leaves doesn't mean it's friendly. <laughs> it needs to be treated with care. So, you know, please guys follow the instructions. I personally don't vape um, oxalic acid simply because I haven't got the kit. Um, but that kit does need to include a certain type of sort of respirator thing. Stephen will know more about that. Yeah, you, you need a organic acid filter in your respirator. Uh, um, and if you're vaporizing, uh, you shouldn't take chances because if the wind changes direction, you can get caught out badly. Mm. I, I think, uh, Richard, one thing um, we ought to warn people about, especially beginners, is that your mite drop, mite counts are all over the place. And I think it depends on the um, what's happened in the colony throughout the summer, because if you get something like a brew break, all the mites then all uh, uh, are on the bees um, then you get some uh, brood, whoosh, they're all going back in. So you get spikes yeah. every every three weeks or so. And um, just because you've got a, a, a low count, a week later, 10 days later, you could have a high one. Even? Yeah, I was going to say there, there are other ways than chemicals. You can uh, shook swarm and then you can put in a, a frame of eggs, um, from another hive into that shook swarm colony. That's the only place the mites can go. You can then take that out and remove it, and that will drop your mite levels if you don't want to use hard chemicals. Mm. I think using the hard chemicals is a little bit of an easy way out sometimes. Um, if you've got a small number of hives, then you could try these various methods of uh, integrated pest management, I think is the gold phrase for it. Uh, yeah. and I think, is there information on Cushman's about that? Roger? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 I, I, I've done the, when I do my shook swarms, I use a sacrifice comb, and it's really effective at breaking the life cycle of the varroa yeah. mite. It keeps your count down for the whole season. In yeah. What uh, has done. Uh, and the brood break from the shook swarm also helps in reducing mite numbers. Uh, the National Bee Unit have got uh, quite a good uh, leaflet on uh, uh, integrated pest management that's uh, that's worth a look, including uh, numbers of counts when you uncap drone brood to, to see the infestation levels and things as well. Uh, Ian's come in on the chat and said that uh, last year my first colony showed uh, virtually no mic drop. Uh, when I did an uh, oxalic acid trickle, however, I stopped counting after 200 mites. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Richard, uh, as we got beginners, it might be worth uh, uh, telling them about um, Samuel Ramsey's video, which is linked on uh, Bibble website. Uh, whatever you do, um, uh, watch that because that that would teach you an awful lot about um, uh, for our, yeah, in, 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 including that uh, that that they don't um, uh, feed on the uh, hemolymph. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to stop myself saying phoretic mites every time now after watching that because I still want to call them that. Uh, but yes, Samuel Ramsey's video is well worth a watch. I uh, will put it in the uh, YouTube description uh, at the end so that people have got that. Um, OK, next question. I'm mightily jealous of this next questioner because they live in Brighton and they have uh, got a place in Midwest France as well. Uh, and the question, uh, which has actually got an awful lot that you could talk about here, I currently live in a flat with no outside space 
and I've always loved bees and dreamt of keeping them. I've just got a cottage in France with a huge garden. I plan to be there for around half the year, uh, a maximum of two months back in the UK. Uh, would it be possible to have a French colony? So this questioner is wanting to know is, can they have bees in France and still flip between France and the UK? Roger. Not a pl bad place to have an outtake, sure, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a commute. <laughs> um, yeah, I think probably the thing to do, well, if, if ever you've got a situation like this, I think it's good to, to get to know the local beekeepers so you can help each other. And I don't know the strength of uh, beekeeping associations in France, um, but that is one of the great strengths, I think, of um, uh, UK beekeeping associations, that everybody's happy to help everybody else. And um, uh, that, I think, will be a, a great thing. Um, I didn't quite understand the business about two months. Where, where, when is he, he back? Uh, yeah, I plan to be there for around half the year, a maximum of two months back in the UK. Um, so... Yeah. It doesn't say when. I mean, if they're going to be yeah. out, out in France during the summer, there's no no so, real, real no real problem. Yeah, uh, I would say that they do have quite a lot of rules surrounding keeping bees in France, and they will depend on the département and also on the local um, agreements. So the first thing to do is to check at your local agricultural cooperative and your local marie, and they will tell you how to register your bees yeah, and what rules you have to follow. Um, they're much, there's much more of that sort of thing in France. I know the rules have changed recently, but there used to be rules about how close to a school you could keep bees and that sort of thing. So um, while it might be possible to keep bees in France, if you're just back in the UK for say November and December, you'd need to check that that's within the regulations. Good point, well made, absolutely. Stephen? Yeah, I was just gonna say the this, this same thing that you, you need to investigate the rules because they vary from department to department as well. Uh, and they may have restrictions on, you know, if you can't spend all your time looking after them, they may have restrictions there. The, the principle of having them uh, remote out April like that is, it's fine. I know a, a former bee inspector that had colonies in Ireland. He had five or six colonies in Ireland. And he only visited them once a year in November. Uh, and the, the key to his success for that was giving them plenty of space. They ran them on four blue boxes. There are other things that um, they come into um, they come into play. Uh, rules and regulations. Um, I'm not sure if foul brood is notifiable in France or not, and it may well be that in parts of the country it is, but not not others. Um, I think rather than just go and uh, set up beekeeping, I think I better find out quite a bit about it. Yeah, yeah. But they I do have very good courses in France, and some of them are subsidised, so you'd be able to improve your French as well. I think uh, the, the first point that the panel made about acclimatizing with a local beekeeper is 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 a good one because actually if you've got a local beekeeper they might look in on your bees on the two months that you're back in the uk if you if you strike yeah. a different relationship with them um uh, yeah it's an interesting one i know that there's a um a, a beekeeper that was in scotland that's uh, recently moved over to france uh, to, to keep bees over there as and retire so that's uh, uh, it might be worth uh, contacting him. I think he's got a blog. I'll put that in the um, in the description as well uh, of the YouTube video. Uh, so uh, how lovely that they get to uh, to flip between uh, Brighton and Midwest France. Uh, next question then is uh, how to move a hive to a new apiary in winter. It's only a mile away. So they're, they're moving a hive from one apiary to another. It's only a mile away and it's in the winter. Uh, Jane, how would you move that hive? Oh dear. Well, if it's in the winter and we got some very cold weather for a few weeks, I would strap it up, um, probably not bothering with a travelling screen, um, very early in the morning, block the entrance, move it and release them because I think if I got a couple of weeks of frosts, 
I think they would be fine. But Roger's probably going to tell me off now because that's perhaps not as good practice as it ought to be. But it is much easier to move things in the winter. Yeah, I would I would agree with you before he tells you off. <laughs> oh, Thank oh. you. I've never told anybody off in my life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I, I don't think bees fly very far uh, during the winter, although incidentally, mine today at 12 degrees, virtually yeah. every hive was bringing in pollen. Not very big um, uh, pellets, but they were. Um, I think much of what they do during the winter is either water collection or uh, defecation. Um, so I don't think they're, go they're going too far. I, I, I would say um, anywhere now, a mile away. Yes, that's all right. And as you say, Jane, with it only being a mile, the chances of the colony overheating in, within that short, yeah. you don't need a travelling screen on in that case, do you? I'm assuming we've got an open mesh floor on. Mm. Um, obviously, I block the entrance, a couple of straps around it. Um, but, uh, you know, as Roger says, they're probably not going far if it's a, a frosty, a good cold snap. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, and if you wanted belt and braces, I would put something, a branch or something in the front of the entrance just so that they know they've been moved or something's happened. That's to try and get the bees to reorientate as they come out. Yeah, we, we're just to remind them that something's changed. Roger's going to tell me off now. No, 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 no not tell anyone else off. Um, but I, I don't think there'd be any need to, even, even with a solid floor. No, but it, um, just a belt and braces, make you feel comfortable. Yeah, but of course, you, 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 you might not want to do it in May or June. No, no. And, and I think that's important to point out. Anybody who's watching this uh, in May or June and thinking about moving bees, we are talking about bees in winter and moving them uh, in, in a cold snap. Uh, things are a lot different when you're moving bees in hot weather. Um, um, next question then is on chronic bee paralysis um, uh, disease. I'm interested to know how you would treat or deal with it because uh, this the questioner from Manchester has had differing opinions and advice. No surprise there. Um, can bees recover from it? I've uh, have seen it in a couple uh, a couple of times in the last three years. Uh, this questioner says. Um, anybody want to have a stab at uh, chronic bee paralysis disease? Stephen. Yeah, I watched the presentation done by Giles Budge, Giles Budge recently, and he suggested there that uh, there isn't any treatment. About 60% of the colonies will recover. Uh, the best thing to help combat it is to give the bees more space. Uh, and I have heard that you give them a bottomless hive, take the floor out of the hive, so that the bees that are suffering will drop out of the hive uh, rather than, than the... Uh, mortuary bees having to carry them out not during wasp season though eh no no no, no. <laughs> it's not usually a problem by that time in, yeah. in the in the season uh jane have you spotted any uh, chronic bee paralysis yes it's a disease of confinement isn't it so after uh, may where i was last year was horrid um and i did have a colony with uh, chronic bee paralysis virus it broke my heart because it was my breeder queen and a colony I particularly wanted to keep, but I, I won't breed from that colony. Nevertheless, um, I didn't uh, do anything terminal. Uh, so far they've come through, but we will see. Um, I did isolate them, uh, but uh, just exactly as Stephen said, I've uh, given them lots of space and fed uh, and that's about all I know how to do, really. Um, but I have seen colonies recover from it. Yeah. I've known people who've lost colonies from it. So it doesn't see, obviously it's a virus and it's not um, uh, rampantly contagious like, you know, EFB or anything like that, but it's not really very desirable. Roger, we, we were saying there it's a, it's a disease of confinement. Um, what are your thoughts on that one? Well, yeah, it, 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 it probably is. Um, 
but it, it it's just really its ugly head again, uh, probably in the last 10 or 15 years, I suppose. Mm. Now, it's it's fairly certain that that was the main or one of the main causes of the Isle of Wight disease, not acarin that, um, that a lot of the books will um, uh, will tell you. So it's fairly clear they had the problems in, in those days. And it's interesting that, uh, that nobody's really found a cure for it. But it makes sense to me that if you can get over the colony over it, then why not requeen it? Because if it is susceptible, if the colony is susceptible um, to it, then um, then surely requeening is, uh, is, is, is a good reason, good, um, a, a, a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, and, and like all uh, pests and diseases, beginners are, are strongly advised to, to, to know what healthy colonies look like and what healthy brood looks like so that you are uh, able to spot when something's not quite right. Um, well, I've, yeah, I, I've spotted something that, uh, that there's, this is just anecdotal. And I've met, I mentioned it to Giles Budge twice now, and both times um, I'm not being disrespectful, but he, he sort of dismissed it. Now, um, I don't know if people are aware or not, but Hoffman spacing is 35 millimetres. English spacing, which is metal ends, plastic ends, castellations, is 38. Mm. Now, if you get a, um, a, a comb of worker brood, it is 25 millimetres thick. Almost spot on. So if you get 35 millimetre centres, um, you get 10 mm. millimetres be gap between the, the combs. If you've got what I call English spacing, you get 13 millimetres, which is 30% uh, more. Now, what I have noticed is that um, chronic bee paralysis virus, in my experience, seems to be more, more of a problem in colonies where you, you've got Hoffman spacing than where you've got what I call English spacing. Now, I've mentioned this to, to Giles, and he doesn't think that's an issue. Um, but I, I'd i like to see some work being done on it. I know it's going to cost money, but I'd, I'd like to see some work done on it. Now, that is, of course, um, crowding, which is what what what, what Jane was um, uh, uh, indicating. Interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, next question, then, is um, a little bit of a long one from North Wales. Um, I have the opportunity to travel for 23 days from the beginning of May next year. How would you advise me to go about preventing my four hives from swarming in my absence? My husband, who is not traveling with me, will not inspect the hives or deal with a swarm. Um, should I turn down the travel opportunity despite uh, really wanting to go? And uh, saying that they should get divorced or find another partner isn't an answer. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, this is almost like the one in France, isn't it? Um, you know, get get local beekeepers to help you. Um, that's what that's what I would suggest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, also, uh, I'd be interested if Jane would support this, but you could shuck swarm them all before you go. If you wanted to be really sure and you're in a suburban area or something, that would be a jolly safe option, wouldn't it? Right. And I have to point out, um, as the uh, spouse of somebody, I only realised last year after 30 years of marriage that my husband cannot be taken to an apiary no matter how well wrapped because he stands there going, ooh, ooh, oh, I don't like this. But he has put in 30 years of um, turning the handle on the extractor. And I may even consider telling him about electric motors in the future. Uh, how does he go when he goes into the apiary? <laughs> well, honestly, <laughs> it's hysterical. You've never seen anything like it. Ooh, ooh, ooh I don't like this. Ooh. It's a good job you've got a good safe pair of hands in your son, because I know that he helps out. <laughs> he helps out, but my husband never goes in the apiary. But he is good on that handle. So I don't feel the need to electrify yet. <laughs> if you've if you've got clip queens, you can go fourteen days between sure. inspections. Um, so um, fourteen days twice is less than the twenty three days. So it only means somebody coming in looking at them after fourteen days after you're going. Yeah. 
Interesting. Jane, if you if you were going down the Shook Swarm uh, idea, she's she's going away at the beginning of May. When would you, uh, would you Shook Swarm them straight away or where, when? If she's going the beginning of May, you see, it depends what the weather's like. Because if, it's, if they're Shook Swarmed, you need to have it warm enough for them to be able to produce that wax. I guess the safest thing would be to move the queens up above a queen excluder and bailey them, maybe. Um, but it, it's some, that would keep them occupied, pulling out the wax. Obviously, you, need, you do need to, to feed them, as Roger said. You can't be leaving them without uh, some he heavy syrup in a contact feeder in uh, May. But... Uh, I guess a bailey would probably be safest because then even if it was a foul May like last year, they've got what's going on downstairs going. So a bailey is another alternative, but I would say a complete comb change, that would be the time to do it. Uh, you know, 21 days or so, um, it would really work. What, 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 just a minute. What, what, what was the date? Um, uh, 23 days from the beginning of May next year. Right, okay, now we've got, think of the possibilities. If it's an RC rape area, Ooh. you'll get a very different, you'll need a very different um, approach than if let's say it's a later season, perhaps. Um, I'm assuming they have Heather in North Wales, they must have. So if you've got a late season, you would probably deal with it differently than if you've got an early season. Um, I've, I've heard of um, some commercial beekeepers putting on several supers with newspaper in between so that the bees can eat their way up through it to, to, to access. And I know that's more of an intermediate moving on to advanced technique, but that could tide her over by giving some extra space in the supers, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that, 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 that's an old trick. Of course, the other thing is there are, there are quite a lot of areas in North Wales that are marginal for bees. Um, so we've got that to come in, into consideration as well. Uh, actually, the question isn't quite as, as easy as it, as, as it might seem. Mm -hmm. There's an awful lot of uh, unknowns, isn't there, and, uh, and variables in, in answering a question like that, Stephen? Uh, I, I would go back to one of the original suggestions was is, is to pal up with somebody and get them to come in and check them, because you can do all of these things and the beggars can still swarm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's 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 very wise to uh, to get pally with somebody in your local association that lives uh, nearby that could uh, can help you out. Yeah. Uh, Perhaps Jane's husband could go and help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so the next one is um, we're just past this uh, this point in the season, uh, but it'll be useful for next year. What's the best way to stop wasps? Keep your colony strong. Um, one problem, if you get a wild colony, a wild nest, it's always strong. You never get weak, weak, weak uh, uh, wild nests, otherwise they do get robbed out. Um, and I'm afraid some of the colonies I see, they're, especially towards the end of the season, they're far too weak. Um, if you can um, keep, the, um, keep, keep the strength up and close the entrances down, then, um, uh, then that's uh, 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 as good as any. Going around killing wasps nests and putting out uh, uh, jars of sugar, water, and that sort of thing, um, you're, you're you're wasting your time. Jane, any uh, any top tips for wasp control? I think uh, Roger's completely put his finger on it. There, that is the the only really sensible and thorough answer. Strong colonies, uh, as Roger said, they. The wasps will go for the weakest colony and uh, then you'll have no, you know, we all know we've all had a vulnerable colony, reduced the entrances, we've tried bits of glass and all sorts of things and you have no option but to move that. The answer is, as Roger says, strong colonies. And Queen right too, because mm -hmm. Queen as colonies towards the end of the year, they lose morale. Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially yeah. if they come uh, under attack. Now, I'm old enough to remember that uh, uh, certainly in West Sussex, we very rarely had um, wasps after the, the first real stiff frost. 
Um, but of course, we don't get the stiff frost anymore. So the wasps are um, are keeping going. The nests are go keeping going a lot longer. And um, where it used to be 30, 40 years ago, you would, we wouldn't see a wasp after the first of uh, or middle of November, really. Um, we're now seeing them way after the new year, um, which um, I'm sure others uh, are as well. And of course, the problem is that bees um, will go into cluster, fairly tight cluster, and the wasps will go in um, unhindered and, and, uh, and they'll go and, ro go and rob out after the bees have um, uh, sort of settled down for the, for, for the winter. Yeah, it's amazing uh, just how cold it can get uh, where the bees aren't flying and the wasps are still they're yeah. still going yeah. and they're, they're still picking on those colonies even though they're, uh, they're it's too cold to uh, to defend themselves uh, properly yeah. Um, so yeah there are a variety of uh, tricks and things that you can find on the internet for different entrances and uh, and bits of glass as, as Jane says but nothing like a strong colony to uh, to give you the best uh, best uh, option Stephen yeah, some, somebody was pushing at the National Honey Show their round entrances, saying that wasps don't mm. go into round entrances. They do. Yeah. I've watched them do it. It's The, the answer is strong colonies. Um, uh, and if they are being attacked, maybe reduce it down to a small entrance. But the answer is really strong colonies. And the underfloor entrances uh, as well. Yes. Now, now, I don't know if this has been um, proven or not. I reckon that bees actually only defend the entrance once they get inside um I, I i i don't think bees touch them and i'll tell you why on many occasions i've seen wasps in feeders now how have they got there mm -hmm. i think they've just gone straight up straight up through and I, i've always had the view that, that bees only defend the entrance i might, might be wrong interesting um, just going uh, back slightly to the uh, the question about the, uh, the the 23 days of travel, Heather's got in touch on on the Zoom in the comments. Uh, she says there's no oilseed rape in the area, only sheep. So uh, <laughs> uh, I think we're still in agreement, though. Finding a, a willing uh, partner at the BKA uh, probably is the best method. Well, uh, sheep sheep pasture traditionally isn't good for bees. You get all sorts of things happening, like miniaturisation of flower, flowers and uh, uh, plants, rather. So, of course, the flowers are smaller, less um, less forage. A sheep pasture isn't traditionally very good. Right. Interesting. Uh, so, our next question, we move now on to honey. Um, oh, oh, excuse me, excuse me. It, height might be a problem, might be an issue as well. You know, uh, 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 altitude, altitude, rather. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, we don't know where in North Wales they are. Or you could easily be up a thousand feet there. Mm. Uh, so we'll move on to another question now. This one's about uh, honey. Um, although it showed no signs of fermenting in the bucket, approximately five months in the bucket, post-warming and jarring, I now find that the jarred honey has or is fermenting. Could I have advice on what to do with this, apart from mead making? Um, and whether it could be fed in small quantities back to the bees in spring. Um, uh, he does, uh, as it's, he says here, he, he does uh, he, uh, test the honey before he seals the buckets, uh, and it's uh, only marginally under 20% mark. Um, when the, uh, uh, Any ideas on what this man from or woman from North Yorkshire could do with this fermenting or fermented honey? Um, Jane, any? Oh dear, that would go to my neighbour for mead making, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, I yeah. wouldn't feed it back to the bees if it's fermenting. Um, mm. if, uh, you know, uh, generally you should only feed back honey whence it came anyway, but not if it's fermented. So, no, that would be John over the road for the mead making for me. Yeah. Do you, do you get something in return for the honey that you give him? Oh, the man's a genius. His raspberry vodka is, has to be tried to. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right. Uh, um, yeah, you you could cook with it. Yes. Um, I'd, I'd like to see 
I, I, I'd like to discuss a bit more about what's probably happened. Mm. Um, now, the, uh, the temperature you keep the honey in makes quite a difference. So if you just sort of keep it under the stairs or, you know, something like that, then I think you're, you're, um, uh, you're going to be quite warm, especially if it's somewhere near an airing cupboard. Um, I've extracted honey on many occasions and it's come from uh, sealed combs and it's been approaching 20%. Um, and I don't know the reason um, uh, for that at all. So I, I can sympathize with the, um, uh, with the questioner, but of course you get something else. You, you can, you can, um, uh, you can sample some of your honey. The thinner stuff is still going to rise to the top. So then you get a layer of the, on, on, on the top, especially if it started to granulate, a granulate, um, mm -hmm. a granulated honey, even if it's the same, will always ferment quicker if it's granulated than if it's, uh, the, the, than if it's clear. So um, to get over the problem in the future, that, that, might, um, that might be an issue. If you've got it in buckets, let it settle for a couple of three days and then test what's on the top. And if that is up to 23, 24%, then I think you've got, um, got a, 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 a bit of a problem. Um, I don't produce my own, or I, I don't um, uh, process my own honey anymore. Other people do. But when I did, uh, I didn't put it straight in the bucket. I used a, a food grade polythene bag. Fill the bag right up, get all the air out of it, and then just put one of these um, plastic, well, no, they're, they're paper toys with a, with a wire through mm -hmm. a twist one of those around so you get all the air out of it um because then you the honey isn't going to take any moisture in from from the air but if you put it in buckets they can still um they still may not be airtight so um i think um uh, i think that will help now um rather different than the other two i'd be happy to feed honey to your own bees in spring um, obviously not with uh, not with supers on, but if you've got a nuke or something like that, if you water it down about 50 50, um, I, I think you'll be okay. I wouldn't do it towards the end of the year because if you do, then you might run the risk of it fermenting going in, going into winter. But certainly, if you've got um, uh, a situation perhaps like Jane mentioned, the, the shook swarm, instead of feeding syrup, feed that to them. I, 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 I think that Paul um, um, uh, Paul Comb out with it quite well. Stephen, I was going to say Roger mentioned about putting it in buckets and uh, not necessarily being airtight. What I do with my buckets is I put a layer of cling film over the top of the honey, uh, and then then put the bucket lid on. And that's got two advantages. One, it, it sort of improves the seal, but it also, when you pull it out, it takes all the debris and the froth off mm. the top. Interesting, yeah. Uh, Roger, important not to feed that fermented honey going into winter. Oh, yes. It could it could give the bees dysentery over the winter. It might do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's going to cause big problems inside the hive. And I, and I, I wouldn't do it with supers on either. No, you don't want them storing it again. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would rather turn it into me, I must admit. I'd, I'd make me there, do it, yeah. Excellent. Um, next question then is, um, would the panel ad advise beginners to use foundation or foundationless combs? So foundation or foundationless combs. So uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, anybody want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I'll have a crack at that one then. <clears throat> um, I've made my own foundation um, for well over 50 years um, and I'm used to wiring the frames and, um, uh, and embedding uh, the foundation. But um, about five or six years ago now, I suppose, uh, one of our members that was for Green uh, said, can, we, um, can you demonstrate foundationless um, you know, uh, beekeeping? So, uh, yes, we did. So we put four or five hives up uh, that way and what I found was that you really need good straight combs there to start with so that you put the foundationless ones in between so the bees don't build all over the place so from a 
they they actually build quite good cones, but you've got to be a little bit careful. And I think this is where there's a, quite a bit of mis, rep, uh, misinterpretation because bees in a natural nest generally put the drone um, on the periphery, drone cells on the periphery. So the outside ones, they're going to put more drone in than if, if, if than they would in, in the centre ones. Um, so I think from a beginner's point of view, get your first colony set up with foundation so you get nice straight combs and then put the um put the foundationless ones in between or as with the starter strip doesn't really matter put them in between uh the good combs don't 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 put them between uh, bad what wa wavy combs put them between straight combs and um i think you'll get some really good combs what you must do and i know some people um, are advising against this what you must do in my opinion is to either wire them or use fishing gut i haven't used fishing gut yet i've used wire because that's what i've got um, um now the the thing is let, let's say that's the frame if you turn the frame that way if it's not wired it, it'll just drop out yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. jane have you used uh, foundationless foundationless frames I had a little tryout a few years ago, and exactly um, what Roger just demonstrated was one of the things that put me off. I tried both strips and triangles in my foundationless frames, and I mean, they worked perfectly well, but what I missed was having the security of wired foundation uh, in that when you manipulate the combs, they're that much less secure. I also learnt that bees who nibble the edges and corners in uh, frames that are wired still do still make that shape and leave voids when they're unwired too and bees that don't don't uh, so they clearly have a sort of personal nibbling style but um, that being able to manipulate them easily is a massive advantage mm. Stephen, have you done any experimenting with foundation? Yeah, um, and I, I tried it once in the brood box, and if I did it again, I would uh, make sure that they were wired. Uh, I do it a lot in the supers for cut comb, but I do them alternate. So you have a, a, a drawn comb, a foundationless comb, drawn comb, alternatively. Otherwise, they'll destroy it any which way they choose. And I saw there was a discussion about uh, cold and warm methods. The bees don't seem to mind which way they do it, particularly when they draw comb out in foundationless frames. They'll draw it out to suit themselves. But important that you get that foundationless frame in between two good drawn combs, otherwise um, they tend so, to go a bit crazy. They draw it, they'll draw it across and they'll draw it in curves and some... A truly wonderful shapes. Yeah, that's interesting what um, uh, Stephen said because if you've got an, a nectar flow on and you alternate um, drawn comb foundation, drawn comb foundation, what the bees tend to do is they extend the drawn comb and then they make the the, found, the comb and the foundation very very thin. If indeed they work on it at all, but if you put um, foundationless or starter tri strips in there, they don't do that. Mm. Well, they don't usually do it. And I think yeah. it's because when they're building the comb, uh, natural comb, they're, they're, they're clustering underneath. When they're uh, building foundation, they're hanging on the side. Yes, I and I, I, I think that's the issue, but I'm, I may be wrong. Yeah, oh, I, I definitely have to try that this summer. I, I use starter strips, I admit. Mm. Interesting. Uh, somebody in the chat saying using uh, two bamboo barbecue sticks vertically yeah. um, is another option for uh, instead of the wire, but gets across the same uh, thing that you were saying, Roger, about the flopping out of the comb. I've yeah. tried it with that and found that they will build a uh, drone comb in the two. I've put two bamboo skewers um, down the frame and they draw drone down either side and worker in the middle. Um, it's uh, it's amazing to, to see. 
Um, excellent. Well, we're, we're already at, uh, at 8.40. Uh, I'm most indebted to, uh, to all of our panellists this evening. I think that that's been a, a really interesting and informative uh, question and answering session. And I, uh, I really hope um, the, uh, the 119 people that are watching on uh, YouTube live uh, and, uh, and the few that we've got in the Zoom meeting uh, I've all enjoyed that uh, and, and found it, uh, it, it interesting. We, uh, our next webinar is on the 11th of January. That's uh, Roger Patterson talking about uh, small scale queen rearing. Um, and um, I, I would say to uh, beginners that um, it's always worth having a dabble at queen, uh, queen rearing, even in your early days, have a, have a go. And I'm sure during that uh, 11th of January webinar, Roger will give you the confidence that you need to be able to, uh, to have a go uh, and try yourself. Uh, uh, I don't know if you'd agree with this, Roger, but making the queens isn't the hard part. Getting them mated pro properly uh, tends to be uh, the hardest part of the whole job. Uh, yeah. But that's... Getting the mate is a big problem, and that's why if you can produce more than more queens than you've got colonies, you stand a better chance of uh, getting mated ones to take you through into the winter. Excellent. Super. Uh, Jane, thank you so much for joining us. Stephen, most indebted to you, and Roger, you're all this year, but thank you uh, very much, uh, as always. Uh, well thanks. chaired, sir. Well chaired. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and we'll, uh, we'll join you again on the 11th of January.